Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program this afternoon, An American Meeting, the Irish and Jews in the Nation's Urban Cauldron, with Professor Hasia Diner. My name is Rachel King. I'm the Executive Director of the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I will be your moderator today. The Jewish Heritage Center collects, preserves, and illuminates the Jewish history of New England and beyond, and works to advance the study and understanding of Jewish history, heritage, and culture. We are located at Boston, um, at, at, in Boston at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, America's founding genealogical organization. Fittingly, this webinar is taking place on an, an auspicious day on the calendar. Today is both St. Patrick's Day and Purim. We look forward to learning from Professor Diner about her research in progress on the entwined history of Irish and Jewish immigrants in America. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to make a few housekeeping notes about this webinar. Uh, you in the audience will be muted throughout. And if you have questions during the presentation, please type them uh, into the Q&A bar at the uh, bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many as we can following um, uh, Hasia Diner's presentation. Uh, and as we are broadcasting from different locations, we ask you to bear with us if we experience any technological issues. Uh, even if there are glitches on our end or yours, uh, we will send you a link uh, to the full recording of this program afterwards so that you can watch and share it later. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, this afternoon. Dr. Hasia Diner is the Paul and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History at New York University, where she has also served as the interim director of the Glucksman Ireland House. Her teaching and scholarly work focus on American Jewish history, American immigration history, and women's history, and she is the author of more than 10 books. Please join me in welcoming Hasia Diner. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me, and it is really a pleasure um, to be spending an hour with you talking about a subject that I think is uh, endlessly fascinating. So let me begin. A songwriting duo, composers who churned out many a tune on New York's Tin Pan Alley, William Jerome, born William Flannery of Irish immigrant parents, and Jean Schwartz, uh, a, a Jean Schwartz, an a Jewish immigrant from Hungary, produced in 1912 a lighthearted piece, but one which I uh, believe punch it packed a very powerful historical punch. If it wasn't for the Irish and the Jews, you see the image there of the sheet music, extolled America, dubbed here Yankee Land, is the only place where they, they, this creative pair, could have ever come together and make music. Along with so many Irish and Jews, they, quote, drove away the blues, and according to the lyrics in the process, transformed the little USA. I'm going to read you a little bit from the lyrics, and I promise you I'm not going to even try to sing. He said, I just returned from Europe. I saw London and Paris, and I'm glad to be uh, home to Yankee land. In fact, the little USA looks better now to me. And then he goes on and he said, you know, I've been thinking about it. If it hadn't been for men like Rosenstein and Hughes, You'd surely have a kingdom. There'd be no democracy. What would this great Yankee nation really, really ever do if it wasn't for a Levy, a Monaghan, or Donahue? Where would we get our policemen? Why, Uncle Sam would have the blues. Without the Pats and Isidores, we'd have no department stores if it wasn't for the Irish and the Jews. Okay, and this keeps going on. And he says, talk about a combination, hear my words and make a noise. On St. Patrick's Day, Rosinski puts a shamrock on his coat. There's a sympathy of feeling between the blooms and McAdoo's. 
he then goes on, and this is going to be the last little part I'm going to quote. You can uh, get the sheet music yourself. There's a sympathetic feeling between the Blooms and McAdoos. Why Tammany would surely fall. In fact, it wouldn't be there at all if it wasn't for the Irish and the Jews. So the song recorded multiple times in the early 20th century. It went on to records, uh, pressed over and over again, offers a clever starting point from which to look at the alchemy that took place when Irish Catholics and Jewish immigrants, along with their descendants, worked together in urban America and in the process remade the nation. The history of the United States has been shaped in part by the arrival of millions of Catholic uh, women and men from Ireland and millions of Jews from Europe who arrived as permanent immigrants. Their numbers and participation in the labor force alone make them important actors in American history. But so too does their involvement with politics, the union movement, education, and popular culture, where Jerome and Schwartz concocted their somewhat silly song, changed their adopted nation. Upon arrival, these largely working class individuals had no cho choice but to come to terms with the reality that although because Although capable of becoming citizens, as religious outsiders, they confronted a deeply Protestant, militantly at so, at times, American public, which defined America as theirs. So to brief overview of both uh, populations, Irish Catholics arrived primarily starting in the mid 19th century, and then the migration continues uh, through the end of the century and into the early 20th century, poor working class, heavily female, they met fierce opposition, partic and particularly the hostility of the Protestant majority, which worried over about their power and their numbers. Over the course of the post-Civil War decades, the Irish immigrants and their sons and daughters made visible places for themselves in American cities and gave those cities their politics, pol labor force, labor unions, public entertainment, and municipal services, a distinctly Irish caste. They created a range of institutions, educational, religious, benevolent, commercial, political, that served as the backbones of their community. The large East European Jewish migration essentially picks up in the late 18, in the 1870s. And while much smaller than the number of the Irish, they concentrated in a few cities, New York in particular. And this population centered in the garment industry and various forms of petty entrepreneurship also transformed their new homes. Like the Irish, um, they included large numbers of women. They had no intention of returning back to their places of origin. And they went about the process of building from the ground up community life. These two collectivities of outsiders, women and men who on the surface had little in common with each other, helped re redefine America. The story of their collective actions tells us much about them, the Irish and the Jewish immigrants, their American born progeny, and about the America which they molded. Now, they bumped into each other, classrooms, labor union meeting halls, and in the smoke filled back rooms of various political organizations like New York's Tammany Hall. They came together by dint of circumstance and not because they believed in an ideology of cultural pluralism. They didn't particularly love each other. Uh, they didn't necessarily seek each other out as allies or partners in some abstract sense, uh, nor did they want to break down the social and uh, cultural and certainly religious barriers which divided them. Both remained fiercely committed to their community and their, tra and their traditions, but they came to realize that they needed each other. For practical purposes, they, they, had to they drew together to pursue a range of goals, economic and political, and consciously or not, they were jointly involved in, this, in an assault on the uh, native-born white Protestant elite, which demonized bo them both and sought to hold them back. Both had something to gain from working together, uh, but in this duo, Okay, like the songwriters, um, the um, Irish and the Jews occupied very different spaces. The Irish having arrived first and in larger number and already controlling mass, substantial and significant parts of the American 
uh, landscape uh, were the ones uh, uh, on the top. And over the course of their history, they opened up doors for the Jews. Uh, and uh, in doing so, the Irish took on uh, their enemies, yet turning that on its head, the Jews, by relying upon the Irish, helped launch themselves uh, onto the path towards security uh, and integration. American urban circumstances uh, drew them together. They realized they had to uh, collaborate in this unequal relationship. Now, when historians um, before me uh, have thought about the Irish-Jewish connection in America, unlike those songwriters from 1912, they have dwelled on the theme of Irish anti-Semitism. They have re referred to the low levels, but constant of street violence perpetrated by uh, thuggish uh, Irish gangs, usually young men who preyed on hapless uh, Jewish victims. Now, I wanna say parenthetically, we have no statistical uh, data as to how often this happened or not, but we do have uh, stories. Those histories of um, the Irish-Jewish contact, uh, which emphasize the uh, anti-Semitism, uh, also quote at, uh, from random sermons delivered by Irish priests uh, who thundered to their parishioners about the eternal perfidy of the Jews guilty of the crucifixion, implying, I guess, that their Jewish neighbors were Christ killers too. The rantings and ravings of Father Charles Coughlin, the flamboyant radio priest, who through his broadcasts reached uh, over 40 million listeners a week in the 1930s, bombarded the American public with a barrage of anti-Jewish words and images, probably without parallel in the history of the United States. Coughlin spewing forth on the vast power of the international Jewish conspiracy has given historians much to work with, providing evidence of the depths of Irish uh, anti-Semitism. Now, on the other side of the equation, how American Jews uh, viewed and inter viewed their Irish neighbors, um, their Irish fellow citizens, um, I can say we have very little scholarship on this. But for what I've seen um, and um, some others in uh, Jewish publications, the Yiddish press, the Anglo-Jewish press, uh, what we find is that uh, Jews very easily partook of the same vicious um, racist anti-Irish rhetoric promulgated by white Protestants um, who repeatedly uh, linked the Irish with drunkenness, with stupidity, with a kind of brutish, uh, almost animal-like neighbor uh, nature. So both sides of the uh, uh, negative part of this story. But I want to do something different. I want to explore how Jews turn to women and men born in Ireland and individuals of Irish descent to help them make their way into American life. How and why did Jews come to consider the Irish as uh, America's best situated, those Americans best situated to help them to pave the road for their integration uh, into their new home? And why did so many Irish women and men take up this, uh, chat, this chore? Now, uh, we uh, just, just you know, per, per, perhaps quite obviously, Jews met Irish and Irish met Jews uh, for the first time on this side of the Atlantic. Jewish immigrants com coming uh, to the United States had no prehistory with people in and from Ireland, and pretty much the same held true in reverse. Yes, there was a tiny Irish Jewish population in Ireland, but it was one that would have made no impress on the millions of Irish uh, immigrants who came to America. Uh, so for Irish and Jews uh, meeting each other in America, interacting with each other in American cities, um, they did so without any old world carryovers. As the group said, but the Irish represented to the Jews a group more settled uh, than their mass arrival, who had the wherewithal to serve the role as mentor and teacher, a population made up of English speakers and citizens whose whiteness allowed them to plunge into and perfect the mechanisms of American politics, uh, the Irish operated on the American scene as able and willing mentors to the Jews. So I'm going to offer in uh, my time here 
a few examples of this Irish mentorship, uh, opening doors, defense of the Jews. So let's look at the, uh, at the defense, the issue of defense. So from the middle of the 19th century on, Jews turned to Irish women and men to help them in their American project. In moments of crisis, uh, they became the mouthpieces or defenders of the Jews to argue their case to the larger uh, society. So as uh, just two examples of this, in New York in 1893, as anti-immigrant, anti-Jewish rhetoric escalated, a group of New York Jewish notables, newspaper editors like Philip Cowan and attorney Max Kohler turned to Charles P. Daly, born in County Galway, then sitting as chief justice of the New York, as a chief ju justice of the New York uh, Court of Common Pleas, a Tammany Hall politician, president of the ancient order of Hibernians, to write what is possibly the first history of the Jews of the United States. Published by the American Hebrew Daily's book, simply entitled The Settlement of the Jews in North America, was a rousing tribute to the Jews, whom he described as, quote, no finer class of citizens. So as anti-Jewish rhetoric was uh, spewing forth in American society, as immigration restriction was moving inexorably uh, towards some kind of uh, uh, um, difficult resolution, Daly showed in his book, as no Jew had ever before, before him, that Jews had been in the present in America since the 17th century, and they could hardly be considered aliens to American life. As other Americans call Jews unassimilable aliens, Daly said they've been here since the beginning. The same year that Daly also published a smaller book called The Jews of New York. And again, he demonstrated the Jews had been there for several centuries. They served as an integral part of the life of the city, good citizens who contributed to the common good and always took care of their own poor. The Jewish reliance, Jewish reliance on Irish individuals to act on their behalf extended into the early 20th century and played itself out in an American context, but from an international perspective. In the aftermath of the murderous pogroms in Kishinev in April 18, 1903, the Irish nationalist and globe-trotting journalist Michael Davitt went to the Moldavian city to investigate what had happened to the Jews and how. Davitt pondered the implications of the horrendous attack on local Jews, declaring to his readers that given the level of violence, the Jews had no future within the pale, which was the title of uh, what would be the title of his book, and that immigration to America and the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine should be the, were the only options they could have. Uh, David had gone to Kishinev in the employ of the Hearst newspapers. When he returned, a group of well-placed American Jews turned to him. They urged David, because he was such a highly identified Irish nationalist, to tell the American public in book form about the horrific outrages that had been perpetrated on the Jews and to stint no bloody detail. The Jewish Publication Society of America then secured David's permission, bundled the articles into a book uh, and uh, entitled it again, Within the Pale, The True Story of Anti-Semitic uh, Persecution. So David's eyewitness accounts as they appeared in the daily press um, and um, then in the Jewish Publication Society uh, book uh, offers an example like uh, Daly's of um, an Irish individual taking up the defense of the Jews. So certainly there are other examples I can share uh, in the Q&A uh, if you uh, are so interested. But secondly, let me turn to the realm of politics. So Jews coming to America and settling uh, for the most part in its largest cities, New York in particular, but also Baltimore, Chicago, Boston, entered into a political realm uh, dominated by Irish men from the street corner on up. The history of Irish prowess and working the machinery of urban politics has been told elsewhere and the path which they seized redefined America and paved a way for all subsequent uh, white male immigrants, not just Jews. 
But for Jews entering into this political reality import, represented an important moment in time. Mostly they came to the United States with little or no experience in the rough and tumble of coalition politics. They had never been uh, partners in what was a quintessentially American dance of being wooed, courted, and appealed to by non-Jews who for the not so simple purpose of getting them, Jewish men, to vote for this party or that, reached out to them as friends, doing favors for them, bringing them into the political process. In every city to which they went, New York at the top of the roster of destinations, Jewish men encountered Irish politicians ranging from ward captains uh, um, on the block uh, and increasingly up the rung of the political ladder, uh, men who wanted them, okay, wanted them for their vote, lusted after their votes. After all, each vote counted and the votes of the Jews one by one carried the weight Came that carried the same weight as the votes of any other men, uh, of any other men. So Irish political operatives showed up at Jewish weddings and funerals, at Jewish protest meetings over uh, outrages in Europe. They came to B'nai Mitzvah and synagogue dedications. They showed up at meetings of B'nai B'rith lodges and Landsmannschaft gatherings. Wherever they could find clusters of Jewish voters, they were there. They translated their campaign posters uh, into Yiddish and they picked up phrases of the Jews' lingua franca in order to win them over. Tammany Hall leaders in the 1890s, in fact, provided the money to launch the first Yiddish newspapers in the United States, and in an unintended process, uh, launched the vast enterprise of Yiddish language journalism in the United States. As one commentator noted about Tammany Hall, but it will be true of the many machines that existed in Boston, because we know Boston didn't have a single unified democratic machine, but it could count for them as well. Tammany knows no race or creed when it's a question of acquiring or preserving political power. Some of its election captains are Jews. Now Jews, in fact, become much more important than just election captains in Tammany and in the other places. George Washington Plunkett, the Irish-born Tammany boss, described in a series of lectures about New York politics on how a typical day he attended a Jewish funeral, a Jewish confirmation ceremony, no doubt a bar mitzvah, and a Jewish wedding. And he was proud of the fact that at the funeral, he went up to the front of the synagogue, so much better to be seen by all the mourners uh, who were gathered there because all of those mourners were potential voters. The stories of these uh, um, politicians and maybe their pictures can be flashed on. Um, certainly in Boston, Martin Lamosny, James Michael Turley, in New York, Johnny Ahern, um, uh, so many more, Charlie Murphy, Al Smith, in Chicago, Michael Deaver um, were full of uh, their outreaches to Jews. Let me just say something about Johnny Ahern, whose picture you had before. He was the, um, he eventually is the, uh, there's Johnny. Uh, he was uh, eventually the uh, borough uh, president of Manhattan and his papers, uh, which are available, the letter books are full of requests from him to city officials to do something for individual Jews. Mrs. Goldberg has a son in prison. Can you grant him a leave for the Jewish holidays? Uh, Miss uh, uh, Levy would like a job teaching school, uh, and on and on. Indeed, one of the letters he writes to the park commissioner, he says, my Hebrew constituents would like to have a pavilion in Central Park, okay, where they could uh, acquire the food they are need that they need for their holiday, meaning during Passover, Jews coming to Central Park wanted a place to buy kosher for Passover food. And it was Johnny Ahern who served at the, as the link to the park commissioner. Now, this was no manifestation of cross-ethnic solidarity. It was no particular uh, love of Judaism. Such behavior on the part of Tammany and its counterparts elsewhere reflected hard-nosed political canny. Jews, Jewish men had what it took um, to be valued by the Irish politico. With no desire and sometimes really no ability to go back, Jews had high rates of naturalization, acquiring citizenship, 
And uh, they turned out to be in part prodded by the Irish Paul's avid voters. Some of the Irish um, machines actually ran naturalization classes and kept tabs on who got naturalized and who showed up to vote um, for, in, in, in Jewish neighborhoods. As the Irish machine workers saw it, better to appoint Jews to visible positions in the party apparatus, give them jobs and campaigns in uh, spots in city government, help them get uh, help, help them help them out in times of need, speak out on their issues, get their votes, even get them a pavilion of kosher for Passover food and simple in um, Central Park, pure and simple than ignore them, because ignore them, they might not vote for you. So as Jews, as Jews ward by ward, city by city, got their first start upward in American urban politics, whether as machine operator and machine operatives as employees of the, in the city bureaucracy or as candidates and office holders, they emulated Irish, the, the Irish American uh, model. The Irish had written the script for them and uh, they uh, followed it. So uh, politics became a very important place where they met and they interacted with the Irish setting the tone, writing the script, and the Jews benefiting from it tremendously. Yet another zone of encounter uh, took place in uh, starting in the late 19th century where Jews learned from the Irish, uh, and this was in the field of labor organizing. The Jewish immigrants who came to the United States after the 1870s streamed into the sweatshops and then the garment factories of the large cities, facing a set of oppressive work conditions which impeded their quest for economic security and violated their human dignity, they embraced unionization. Their labor organizations, particularly the International Ladies Garment Workers Union founded in 1900, and the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, which sewed men's clothing organized in 1914, served as potent weapons to help improve the quality of their lives, enhance their earning power, control the conditions of their labor, and secure the future of their, ch their children uh, while they asserted themselves in a capitalist economy. But Jews had come to the United States with no real tradition of labor organizing. The Bund, the General Federation of Jewish Workers in Poland, Lithuania, and Russia, did not come into being until 19, 1897, and until the first decade of the 20th century, it struggled to stay alive. Even those Jews who uh, came after 1905 uh, and had experienced uh, the first real infusion of militants in the Russian Jewish labor movement emigrated from a land which banned unionization and suppressed with brutal force the, the whole holding of public meetings, publishing political tracts, and making speeches in the name of the class struggle. So the Jewish masses did not come primed for organizing. They entered in America, which didn't particularly embrace the idea of workers organizing and pressing for demands and concessions for their employers, but they had the right to do so. Organizing had been going on for decades and much of it undertaken by Irish women and Irish men. They were the founders of uh, the Knights of Labor, okay, and the American Federation of Labor, which has been one important Jewish founder, Samuel Gompers, uh, but uh, he worked in concert with um, uh, Irish uh, men uh, associates. By and large, Irish women and men stood at the forefront of the American labor endeavors. Men like Peter O'Brien and Peter McGuire, who founded the AFL and gave us Labor Day, uh, and Terence Powderly, a uh, leader of the Knights of Labor, took on Jewish students. And we can think of Gompers as indeed uh, the apprentice to uh, O'Brien and, and McGuire. Um, they taught budding Yiddish uh, activists the ropes on how to organize workers in America. The United Garment Workers Union under Irish leadership made the first inroads among those uh, who sold men's clothing. It had a significant Jewish membership. And while a large faction broke off in 1914 to form the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, um, the uh, years in the United Garment Workers were an important apprenticeship period for Jewish labor activists, learning from the Irish what and what not to do in the creation of a union of their own. There's a wonderful little line in the um, autobiography of a woman named Agnes Nestor, Irish, uh, daughter of Irish immigrants, um, who is really the kind of one of the brains of the Chicago labor movement. And she describes how a young Sidney Hillman came to see her 
at the suggestion of John Fitzpatrick, the head of the Chicago Federal Federation of Labor, saying he was trying to uh, embark on a um, uh, um, effort to uh, organize uh, the uh, uh, workers, the garment workers in the Hartshaft Mark, uh, Marx plant. And Agnes Nestor in her autobiography says, can you imagine I taught Sidney Hillman how to organize? Sidney goes on to become uh, FDR's Mr. Labor. And uh, clearly he learned his lessons well, but he learned it from an Irish American woman, Agnes Nestor. Jewish women labor leaders like Rose Schneiderman. Okay, and again, we have the pictures now of a number of these, both Irish and Jewish women. Uh, Jewish women labor leaders also learned, this is Leonora O'Reilly, um, uh, 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 Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, and I'm gonna say something about her specifically in a few minutes. Uh, um, uh, women, uh, Jewish women labor leaders learned the tool of unionization from these Irish women who had preceded them to America and it embraced the idea that only collective action could control workers, could, would improve workers' conditions. In the Wage Earners uh, Suffrage League of the early 20th century, Rose Schneiderman, next picture, a young Jewish immigrant, there she is, there's Raj, a young Jewish immigrant garment worker fell under the spell of Leonora O'Reilly, and that was the drawing we saw before, who showed her in her fiery speeches that the conditions of labor and the limitations endured by women could not be disassociated. They needed to cut, to be conquered together. So too, Bessie Abramowitz learned from Agnes Nestor, Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, um, and uh, others. And she too, like Schneiderman, dedicated her life to labor organizing. Schneiderman, Abramowitz, Lillian Hurstein, um, and so many others uh, achieved what they did on the strength of their own intellect and drive, but what they learned, um, they got directly and indirectly from the Irish women who had preceded them. Uh, Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, who is based here in Boston, um, plays a very pivotal role in Jewish labor history. Uh, Louis Brandeis admits that until he heard Mary Kenny O'Sullivan speak, about labor, despite the fact that he was already a seasoned lawyer, was already a critic of American monopoly capitalism, he said, until I heard Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, I didn't realize that labor was part of this. He goes on to be this important figure in American labor law. So we've had uh, the defense of the Jews, uh, politics, labor organizing, and then a final zone in which uh, this uh, duo of Irish teachers and Jewish students took place, literally took place in classrooms in uh, New York, Chicago, Boston, and elsewhere. When Jewish immigrants disembarked uh, from their uh, journey across the ocean, um, those children among them went directly into American classrooms, where more likely than not, they met school teachers, women who themselves, who had had, who themselves or had parents who had been born in Ireland. The hundreds of thousands, indeed millions, of children born in New York, Chicago, Baltimore, Boston, Philadelphia, and so, and, and so on to Jewish immigrants' parents took par partook of the most profound American lessons taught by Irish women who staffed the city's public schools. These schools provided them with crucial settings in which Irish Americans taught Jews how to fit in. These uh, teachers were the ones who taught them, uh, were essentially the engineers of Jewish mobility in America. These legions of Irish American women were the guide to uh, learning language, the details of American culture, and to certainly the basics of reading, writing, arithmetic, and beyond. The Jewish women, the Jewish children of sweatshop workers and factory laborers and pushcart operators sat behind their desks and year after year faced teachers, women whose mothers and fathers had been born in um, um, Ireland. These women served as the front lines of exposing newly immigrate, newly arrived Jewish children to literally what it meant to be an American. They showed them by their dress, their speech, their hairstyles, their comportment, the ideal of America, of middle-class American life. It mattered little that most of these Irish teachers had come from working class homes and most had mothers who had once lived, labored as domestic servants. To the Jewish immigrant children fresh from Lithuania, Ukraine, Belarus, Galicia, and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, 
And to their awestruck parents who knew no English, these women represented American culture. They led the immigrant Jewish children in the Pledge of Allegiance, teaching them to put their little heart, their little hands on their hearts. Um, they taught them to sing the patriotic hymns and inform them of uh, Thanksgiving, Lincoln's birthday, Washington's birthday, drilling them in spelling the times tables and American history. These Irish women uh, function as key players in the project of immigrant in integration with Jewish children um, entering these uh, many classrooms with no English at their command, yet expected by their parents to master the skills of American life. What went on in these classrooms mattered a great deal to the uh, development of American history. Um, the uh, Irving Howe in his magnum opus, um, uh, The World of Our Father, talks a little bit about these women. And um, having read hundreds of memoirs, I, he asks the question rhetorically, there must have been a bigot or two among these uh, teachers, but if the memoirs uh, tell us anything, it's um, they never mention this, and they talk more. Uh, they talk uh, incessantly about the warmth of these women, uh, these Irish women, as they engaged with their Jewish students. Now, one of these women we actually know um, kind of somewhat well. Uh, Myra Kelly was one of them. Born in Dublin, she came to the United States with her father, a physician who established a medical practice on the Lower East Side, the greatest concentration of Jews in the United States. And while she herself hailed from a privileged background, she, like many other Irish American uh, women, uh, went into school teaching. And uh, most of her career was at PS 147 in the heart of the Jewish East Side immigrant enclave. We know about Myra Kelly because she decided to uh, take her experiences in the classroom and translate them into literature. And she wrote a series of uh, short stories um, which came out as books aptly titled Little Citizens, Little Aliens, Wards of Liberty. Her protagonist, Constance Bailey, teaches Russian Jewish immigrant children the intricacies and puzzles of American life. Her sweet tales offer us a small window into the very large and important historical phenomenon, the meeting between Irish and Jews, literally as teachers, and Jews literally as the students who learn from them. Now, um, as we move into the 1920s, many Jewish women, uh, the daughters of immigrants themselves became school teachers. And once again, they met Irish women now as principals and as the seasoned teachers in the schools at which they taught. In New York, many of the young Jewish women who went to um, get sort of to, to train to become teachers attended uh, the Maxwell's, Maxwell Training School, which was essentially an institution of higher learning, which um, trained uh, uh, people, we were mostly women, to become uh, teachers. And at Maxwell, most of the teachers um, were uh, Irish. Uh, uh, um, so once again, the teacher-student re uh, relationship uh, was replicated. So in an oral history, one Jewish informant who had gone to the Maxwell School uh, talked about an encounter, her encounter with these teachers. And she offers us the following, okay? She, and she notes that many of the uh, Irish, sir, many of the teachers were the daughters of Irish servant girls who had taught, who had worked in quote, the finest homes. So here is the informant from the oral history. The teachers, the, the, the teachers, taught the Jewish girls, Jewish students, quote, quote, the oh so, pro, oh so proper manners, um, oh so proper manners, and they tried to teach us the same. In the spirit of noblesse oblige, we, meaning the Jewish students at Maxwell, quote, were forever invited to their genteel, genteel tea parties. We who drank tea from a glass at home were trying to lift our pinkies like our teachers. Okay, and the teachers reminded us that to be a teacher meant to be a lady and quote, we should learn to be ladies by emulating them, implying that we Jewish women had no idea of what a lady meant and indeed we needed help in this. Ladyship, teaching strategies and teaching strategies, strategies and even the proper drinking of tea etiquette flowed from the Irish to the Jews. Now, the, uh, I'm going to offer now again one final educational setting in which Jews gained access to America by means of Irish teachers. And this took place at a range of Catholic universities 
which opened their doors to Jewish students. At universities uh, starting in the 1910s, uh, like Notre Dame, think the Fighting Irish, uh, Fordham, Georgetown, Creighton in Omaha, Loyola of Chicago, DePaul in Chicago, and St. John's, um, which was then in Brooklyn, professional schools in particular like law, medicine, pharmacy, and, pharmacy and dentistry became in the 1920s safe spaces for Jewish aspirants to professional training. As private non-Catholic professional schools erected barriers to Jewish applicants in precisely these years, um, establishing quotas to uh, limit their chances of getting in, Catholic universities founded by Ur Irish clergy opened the doors. While even some Jewish undergraduates attended these schools, these histor the historically significant encounter took place in the professional level. These Catholic universities with their Irish founders, administrators, alumni, and board of trustees, all Irish, all uh, you know, obviously all Catholic, saw in Jewish students qualified applicants who had paid tuition, performed satisfactorily, uh, and um, would enhance the school, um, having no obligation to take them in. And since these were Catholic institutions, they did so uh, anyhow. For some of these schools, uh, shareholders, the admissions of Jewish students, nearly all men, may have grown out of, the, out of a newly found ideological commitment to interfaith cooperation and cross-religious dialogue. But for the most part, the admission of Jewish students served very utilitarian purposes, including simply to admit students who could pay tuition. That the students might do well that, and once they graduated become loyal donors also mattered. Louis Lefkowitz, the long-serving uh, New York Attorney General, as a young man had attended Fordham Law School in his home borough of the Bronx, and he became a, law, a lifelong supporter and donor to the school using his name, which carried quite a lot of clout in New York uh, on behalf of the school. In the years that the young Lefkowitz attended the Jesuit Irish dominated school, Jews made up about 15% of the law students. And we had a little picture there before of uh, Fordham's pharmacy school, uh, which was strikingly by 1930, over 60% Jewish. Uh, it had a Jewish dean. Uh, and uh, when in the um, early 1930s, a, an inspector from the Jesuit order coming from Rome visited Fordham, he uh, told the president and the trustees that uh, Jesuit University could not have a Jewish dean. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the Fordham administrators, however, said that um, uh, Dean, and his name happened to be Jacob Diner, I do not believe he's any relationship, uh, any relation, um, that um, he served the school well and they would not replace him. So beyond the obvious realm, the, the fact that this begins and really takes off in the 1920s counts. In that decade, anti-Jewish and anti-Catholic sentiment in America soared and, um, it, and uh, was uh, seriously threatening. Uh, it was the decade that the Ku Klux Klan grew greatly in membership, achieved respectability and political visibility, targeting Jews and Catholics alike. Uh, the Catholic professional schools like Fordham or Georgetown or uh, St. John's, which again was very heavily Jewish in uh, law and um, uh, pharmacy and business, uh, that these Catholic professional schools declared by virtue of their admissions policies, uh, they, they declared by virtue of their admissions policies that they did not share in the prevailing prejudices so rampant among uh, white Protestant Americans. By doing so, they made a moral statement announcing that as Catholics and as Irish people, they did not share in the hatred against Jews seizing the Protestant nation. Their own history of persecution in the past, their experiences in the present of victims of Protestant American xenophobia made them more sensitive to the difficulties being endured by Jews. That these institutions created by and for Irish Catholics used their, cath their classrooms and laboratories, lecture halls and moot court chambers to teach young American Jewish men, uh, pushing them into the ranks of the successful American uh, middle class, grew out of, again, both the practicalities 
and the assaults both groups endured in the 1920s. So um, in this example of how Irish Catholic professional schools made room for Jewish students, I'm bringing this story to a close. I'm bringing my lecture to a close. I'm bringing it full circle, recapitulating my words here. Jews had much to gain by their encounter with the Irish and so too in reverse. In this complicated in encounter, both sides looked at each other across a set of otherwise powerful divides, seeing possibilities for mutual benefit. That benefit was for themselves. But as the lilting song uh, from the lectures start proclaimed, if they hadn't worked together and uh, relied upon each other, quote, there'd be no democracy. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, to the uh, Weiner Center for inviting me, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Hasia. That was absolutely fascinating, and um, you know, it's it's always good to um, be encouraged and stimulated to think about uh, historical, you know, sort of conventional understandings um, differently. And you've really encouraged us to to um, look again at the, um, at the relationship between two groups and this, this sort of stereotype of um, you know, anti-Semitism and antagonism and so on. Um, so uh, I encourage everyone, we've had some questions um, submitted and um, please feel free to um, add your questions to the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen and we will um, jump right in. So, um, some people have asked about, um, a number of people are asking about intermarriage between um, Catholic Irish and, and, and Jews. And I think we're, we're talking about in this sort of early period, um, you know, immigrant period. Um, but also I'm wondering alongside that, you mentioned these, these sort of, um, you know, mutually beneficial kind of self-serving um, relationships and exchanges in the areas of politics and, you know, the, the politicians going to, um, you know, the B'nai Mitzvah and, and so on. Um, were there actual friendships that, that um, resulted or was this all, you know, very sort of transactional? And, and then the second part of the question is, you know, were there actual, was there actually intermarriage? Right. So friendship blossoms to intermarriage. Uh, yes. And so, um, you know, this is certainly not the kind of information that comes from any kind of statistical or government reports, but certainly memoirs and autobiographies and um, uh, other kinds of sources, biographical details actually gives us a picture that this was not well, it was certainly rare. I mean, intermarriage generally between Jews and non-Jews was rare until the 1960s. It certainly happened, and there were certainly famous uh, uh, cases of this. Um, uh, so the case of uh, Irving Berlin okay, uh, is one. Uh, um, uh, Harry Golden, who is a sort of Jewish humorist who wrote uh, Only in America, who was the editor of the Carolina Israelite, he married an Irish woman and he said, I never wanted to marry anyone other than an Irish woman. Uh, and so you see these a lot in these sort of sort of little autobiographical nuggets and um, as well as stories of friendship, of uh, um, uh, people who knew each other from school or from the street or through athletics, which is actually another whole area in which uh, Jewish athletes used um, um, Irish um, sporting fields uh, because they couldn't go to the uh, Protestant clubs. And um, so, um, yeah, so there are lots of stories about friendship, uh, some of them lasting for a lifetime. Uh, 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 Paul O'Dwyer, who becomes the mayor of New York, he comes himself from Ireland, um, has his best friend from St. John's is another Jewish, as a Jewish law student, and they set up a law practice together. Okay, so um, these uh, pop up, okay, and you cannot put numbers on them, but let us say they were not uh, uh, unknown. And um, there were a whole slew of, in fact, popular culture documents or texts about Irish Jewish marriages. And uh, there was a very popular um, stage play, and then it became a movie, and then there were spinoff movies called AB's Irish Rose and the Kellys and the Cohens. And um, the uh, takeaway from these is, 
yeah, you know, we're really different, but in the end, uh, what we cherish is a society that works. Lovely, thank you. Um, and I do love, it's very poignant, the scene you painted of the of the classrooms with the, the teachers, um, you know, sharing their understanding of, you know, how to be an American with um, the young Jewish and Irish kids. And um, it's, it's very poignant. Um, so uh, let's see, we have lots of questions. Um, one quick question, could you repeat the name of the teacher who authored the short stories about Jewish immigrants? Sure. Myra Kelly. Myra Kelly. Um, we also had um, in the area of labor, um, Marion asks um, if the men and women um, who were labor leaders um, of both groups, did they interact with, have influence on um, Francis Perkins? Is there any link mm -hmm. there? Yeah, well, certainly um, the people, um, the, the, the uh, labor leaders in New York, like uh, Rose Schneiderman and Pauline Newman, uh, uh, working with uh, Leonora um, O'Reilly, who really was just this really important figure, were very closely associated with Francis Perkins. Uh -huh. And uh, they, again, teach her, okay, you know, about what's going on and um, uh, um, have a tremendous impact on her consciousness about um, uh, the the fact that laborers should be workers should be entitled, okay, not given as a gift, but should be entitled uh, to the right to organize and to have control over the conditions of their labor. Um, and um, so, uh, um, you know, it's very interesting in the in the Jewish histories written about first the uprising of the twenty thousand in nineteen oh nine, and then the aftermath of the Triangle Fire. Um, the way Jewish American Jewish historians have written about this, this is a purely Jewish event, and it absolutely was not. And so in the uprising of the 20,000, um, uh, Leonora O'Reilly uh, is, you know, out there passing out the literature, getting them organized, giving them their picket signs, telling them where to go, telling them what to do. And um, these were a bunch of, you know, 20,000 young women. They never did this before. And here's this veteran, you know, coming back from the Knights of Labor, uh, um, showing them, you know, how to line up on the street, what to do when the police come. Uh, so um, it's, I think, a very important, um, uh, shall we say, antidote to history that is kind of siloed. Jews tell stories about themselves, Irish tell stories about themselves, Italians tell stories about themselves, but yet these are porous uh, um, categories. And um, they were probably not even silos in the old country, as it were, but they surely are not in America. Um, th thank you. And that leads um, well to a question from Randall who asked, can you compare the Irish politicians mentoring of the Jews with um, that of other groups, such as the Italians, I assume the Irish favored their votes as well. Um, okay, so that's a great question. And so, yes, I mean, they certainly reached out to Italians, but never with the intensity that they reached out to Jews, oh. because Italians had a much lower rate of naturalization. Okay, so many of them uh, um, hoped, and in fact did go back home, that they didn't naturalize. And they tended to not have um, as intense rates of voting as Jews did. Okay, in addition, Irish and Italians squabbled with each other in uh, over church matters. The Italians really pressing uh, the Irish who control the Catholic Church about language uh, for com for confession and who can be a priest and what's going to be go on in the parochial schools and the Irish you know really set up a barrier you know, the Italians have to conform to them and so the Italians don't particularly like them and um, there's way less uh, investment so there are Jews who are handpicked by Tammany long before there are Italians handpicked by Tammany okay so they certainly they don't exclude them but it's not with the same level of, um, one might say, lust, as they lusted after Jewish voters. Thank you. Um, there's another fascinating question about, um, was there any influence of Irish nationalism on Zionism? Okay, absolutely. And so um, 
we might uh, think of it this way. American Zionists were constantly, you know, really from the uh, end of the uh, 1890s, you know, when the movement is first started as a movement, um, constantly complaining that they can't get Jews to sign on, that the Jews are so ununited, that they're not, they're apathetic, they're just interested in the material rewards of being in America, and they can't motivate them. And in every, nearly every article, they say, but the Irish are able to do it. The Irish can fi have figured out how to get everybody out for uh, uh, nationalism. They go to each other's events. Uh, Rabbi Joseph Krauskopf speaks at the uh, first Irish race convention. Uh, um, the Irish nationalists from Ireland go to Jewish institutions in um, the United States, in Chicago, in New York, in Boston, and give speeches to, um, to Zionists about what they've done. And um, they express what I call Irish envy. <laughs> and um, they just, now the Irish nationalists were never as successful in America as the Jew, as the Zionists thought they were. And they were certainly not as united as the Zionists thought they were. But for the Zionists looking at them, they were the paragon of diaspora nationalism. And if only we could be like them. Wow, fascinating. I'd love to hear more on that, that topic. Um, we'll, we'll take a moment for another couple of questions. Um, John asks, do you, uh, Hasia, do you provide online courses? My appetite is whetted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't. I mean, I guess if somebody set it up, I'd be happy to, but I think I am so done with Zoom. I guess I go on Zoom now, but uh, for, I mean, uh, who knows? I mean, maybe someday I would. And, um, you know, John, if you would like to send me an email, I could certainly send you some material and I'd be happy to open a conversation with you. How, how nice. Um, you can find uh, Hasia on the nyu.edu website under faculty. Um, and the good news uh, for us all is that you are writing a book, are you not, on this topic? Um, Absolutely. So we, we very much look forward to that. Um, hey, this, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I guess one, one question that seems fitting to wrap up on is, um, if you can speak to the legacy of the relationship between these two groups and the immigrant era um, for for their descendants and for you know immigrant groups today, and really okay, so think, for all of us today. Yeah. So I mean, I want to begin with that part first, or rather than their um, descendants. Um, other than their, many of their descendants have fabulous stories. You know, people I've um, interacted with who said, oh, yeah, I went to St. John's or I went to Fordham or I lived in Highbridge and our neighbors were, you know, we really got along with each other. Uh, and so those memories really carry on in, in, in life. But I think for thinking about the society we live in now, where I think, sadly, we are living in a kind of siloed world where people uh, define issues in terms of what's in it for me. Uh, and um, my, uh, my needs, failing to recognize that my needs are never served just by me, that I cannot make a just society on my own. And it has to be in um, cooperation with and in alliance with others. We may not share other things, but only by working together can we uh, create a more humane society. And I think about the... Um, tremendous role played by Irish politicians in trying to defeat immigration restriction, okay? And that they were, you know, there, there are so many more of them than there were Jews, and they really carried the banner. They failed, but they really carried the, the banner uh, um, to try to, pre to, to prevent it. And um, uh, they certainly cared about Irish immigration, Okay, and there were some really odd things about the quota system, but you know they knew their Jewish constituents cared about this issue tremendously, and um, in a way, if they hadn't been doing it, Jews might have been kind of like the solo voices uh, in Congress um, uh, trying to prevent restriction. And they had these powerful allies um, working with them. And if I could just offer one story, and because I think I certainly talked about the 1930s and Coughlin and so on. 
in the early, in the mid 1930s, Samuel Dickstein, who was congressman from New York and a product of Tam, a ta total Tammany hack, but he was very concerned about this upsurge of Nazism in the United States and the, um, uh, create the efflorescence of a number of anti-Semitic groups. And he thought Congress needed to establish a committee uh, which I run, which is called the House on American Activities Committee, which we tend to associate with anti-communism, but it was founded in the, in the 1930s to ferret out Nazis, okay, um, operating in the United States and proto-Nazi groups. And he understood that he as a Jew could not chair this committee because it would look like he's serving. So who does he turn to but your John McCormick, uh, the Congressman from Boston. And, and McCormick uh, chairs the committee for Dickstein. Now that's a, a beautiful example to me of saying my cause and your cause dovetail and we will ac accomplish something. We'll accomplish more together than apart. Um, I, I can't think of a better note to end on. Thank you so much, Hasia Diner. Um, that, was, that was lovely and so thought-provoking. We look forward to hearing more from you. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. Pleasure having you. Um, I, that's all the time we have today, but before we leave, I would like to let you uh, in the audience know about a couple of upcoming programs with the Jewish Heritage Center. Um, on March 31st, we are co-sponsoring the uh, Jewish Arts Collaborative's Kitchen Explorations Program, which features um, Sephardic family recipes for Passover. Uh, we also invite our friends and supporters to join us for a special evening in Boston on May 19th, when we will have an exclusive program with three eminent authors, Anita Diamond, Allegra Goodman, and Rachel Kadish, who will discuss drawing on Jewish history for their literary inspiration. Um, registration is going live for that in the next few days, so um, we hope you'll check back on our website soon, jewishheritagecenter.org. Um, thank you so much to all of you in our audience this afternoon. Um, as you leave this program, you will be asked to take a brief survey, and um, we hope that you will uh, take a minute to fill it out, uh, as your feedback is very valuable to us in developing further programming. And as I had mentioned, uh, we will also be sending you a follow-up email with a link to this presentation. Uh, I invite you to learn more about the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center on our website, uh, jewishheritagecenter.org. And I do want to mention that this free program was made possible by contributions to the Jewish Heritage Center and New England Historic Genealogical Society from people all over the world. Um, we ask you to please consider making a donation of your own if you can. Thank you very much. We hope you will join us again for our upcoming programs and wish you happy springtime holidays, whatever it is that you are celebrating. Goodbye for now.